Artificial sugars are everywhere. You would be hard pressed to find a coffee shop that doesn't have hundreds of small blue, yellow, or pink packets throughout, or a vending machine or soda fountain that lacks a diet variety. It's the result of hundreds of years of pioneers desperate to make the sweetest taste. The companies making them seek a cheaper alternative to sugarcane sucrose, while most of its consumers want to indulge without the unhealthy effects of sugar. But everyone wants things to just keep getting sweeter. From the use of lead to the theories of cancerous chemicals, we'll be going through all this and more as we learn something new. To start, we're going to go back, all the way back. Because for as long as humans have been around, they've been wanting something sweet to eat. Before sugar, there was honey. Since parts of Europe, Africa, and Asia have all had bees while humans were starting up their civilizations, honey was a huge part of their culinary repertoire, starting out by seeking out the hives, but eventually domesticating the bees themselves. Sugarcane itself would first be cultivated in New Guinea, where people would chew on the reeds for their sweetness, and from there, it pretty much took over, spreading to the Philippines and India, then eventually to the ancient Greeks and Romans. The Romans in particular were fond of the sweetened food, but their sweet treats were mostly limited to the taste of fruits, since sugar was still hard to come by. Especially when it came to making wine, the Romans were very experimental with their recipes and techniques. At one point, it was discovered that boiling off the unfermented grape juice that had been used to make wine could actually produce an even sweeter liquid called the frutum and large quantities were made, resulting in long nights of slow boiling to produce a purer product. However, extended periods of heating lead pots caused some lead to soak into the liquid, which interacted with the acetate ions, resulting in lead acetate. Lead acetate, which would later become known as sugar of lead, is actually a salt that has a sweet flavor. But that's where the pleasantness ends, as sugar of lead is, like every other part of lead, poisonous to humans. After noticing the sweetest batches were coming from lead pots, entrepreneurial producers went to a pure lead pot process, thus spreading more of this liquid lead acetate into the public. In the ever-present search for more profit, Roman innovators found a way to crystallize the essence of this sweetness, the lead acetate. This also became a wildly popular ingredient when cooking, believed to have been included in approximately 20% of their meals. In modern attempts to recreate the methods used, it's been found that in each of the servings of wine, there were more than 1,000 times the widely accepted limits for lead content. This meant that many Romans, from soldiers to politicians and workers to peasants, were becoming increasingly ill, having a laundry list of symptoms including vomiting, cognitive difficulties, hearing loss, irritability, and fatigue. It was so bad and pervasive throughout the Roman culture that the tainting of food and drink from the sugar of lead as well as the use of lead in the aqueducts have been seen as one of the causes of the decline of the Roman Empire. From here we step away from lead and move ever closer to the modern day. You may have heard of the sweetener saccharin before, maybe by the name of Sweet and Low, but it had quite the journey before becoming the premier sweetener. Saccharin was discovered in 1878 in the Johns Hopkins University Laboratory of Ira Rimson, a professor of chemistry. He worked with sulfobenzoic acids, eventually publishing 75 papers on these and related compounds, laying the groundwork for the discovery of benzoic sulfonide, also known as saccharin. Now, in 1877, a Russian chemist named Konstantin Falberg was hired by the H.W. Perot import firm in Baltimore. H.W. Perot was a sugar importer, and the company enlisted Falberg to analyze a sugar shipment impounded by the U.S. government, who was questioning its purity. H.W. Perot also hired Remsen, asking him to provide a laboratory for Falberg's tests. After completing his analysis and while waiting to testify at the trial, Falberg received Remsen's permission to use the lab for his own research, eventually being allowed to join in on the Institute's research. In June of 1878, after a day of laboratory work, Falberg sat down to eat dinner. He picked up a roll with his hand and bit into a remarkably sweet crust. As it turns out, Falberg had brought his work home with him, having spilled an experimental compound over his hands earlier that day without properly cleaning them afterward. Against all common sense, he immediately went back to the laboratory, where he tasted everything on his work table all the vials, beakers, and dishes he had used for his experiments. Finally, he found the source, 
an overboiled beaker in which O-sulfobenzoic acid had reacted with the phosphorus chloride and ammonia, producing benzoic sulfonide. Just a few months later, Rensen and Falberg published a joint article describing two methods of saccharin synthesis. Though they specifically noted its taste was even sweeter than cane sugar, neither discoverer seemed interested in its commercial potential. At least, not at first. In 1884, after he had left Remsen's lab and without notifying his co-discoverer, Falberg applied for German and American patents on a new method for producing saccharin more cheaply and in greater quantities. In these patents, he claimed to be the sole discoverer of what he called Falberg's saccharin. With his newly patented production method, Falberg set up shop in New York City, where he and one of his employees produced 5 kilograms of saccharin a day for use as a drink additive. Soon offered in pill and powder form, saccharin's popularity grew quickly. Doctors began to prescribe it to treat headaches and nausea. Canneries used it as a preservative. Diabetics used it to sweeten coffee and tea. As saccharin use rose, consumers, regulators, and competitors all began to question its supposed harmlessness. Falberg had already tried the substance. After consuming 10 grams of the chemical, he had waited 24 hours and experienced no adverse reactions. But by 1906, as mentioned in my video on ketchup, Congress had passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, the first attempt to regulate the nation's food supply. By 1907, saccharin was already widely used in sodas and canned goods, but most Americans had no idea it was in their food. As part of a series of sweeping food and drug reforms, Harvey Wiley, the head of the Chemical Division of the United States Department of Agriculture, recommended banning saccharin for possibly being toxic. And that might have worked but someone was willing to stand in his way. Theodore Roosevelt was president when the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, but when he was approached with the subject of the safety of saccharin in 1908, he drew a line. Roosevelt's doctor had prescribed a sugar-free diet, and he was using saccharin in its place. While Wiley described saccharin as a coal tar product totally devoid of food value and extremely injurious to health, Roosevelt responded, Anyone who says saccharin is injurious to health is an idiot. Yet, in 1912, the use of saccharin was banned in the manufacture of processed foods, but it was still sold to consumers as a standalone product. Diabetics and people wishing to lose weight regularly purchased saccharin, but when a sugar shortage caused a massive price increase during World War I, its use really exploded. And the same thing happened again during World War II. But in 1937, a new substance was discovered when a University of Illinois grad student was working on a fever-reducing drug and tasted something sweet on his finger during a smoke break. That sweet taste was cyclamate, a chemical that's 30 to 50 times sweeter than sugar. By 1963, cyclamate was America's favorite artificial sweetener, costing a tenth of the price of sugar and with zero calories. By 1968, Americans were consuming more than 17 million pounds of the stuff each year. But that all came to a halt when the sweetener was proven to cause bladder cancer in rats, resulting in an immediate ban by the FDA that's still in effect to this day. Another study in 1970 showed evidence of saccharin also causing bladder cancer in rats, leading to it being banned in 1977. This time, food manufacturers, lobbyists, and consumers immediately fought back, worried of losing their last artificial sweetener. The ban was soon changed to a warning, and the labels were added to products that contained saccharin. Luckily, later studies showed that the increased incident of bladder cancer was only applicable to rats due to their particular biology. The results of the earlier studies were not transferable to humans. In 2000, saccharin was taken off the government's list of known carcinogens, and the warning labels were discontinued. While other sugar substitutes have since been developed, saccharin still remains one of the most popular, accounting for 70% of the world demand for zero-calorie artificial sweeteners as of 2001, with world sales in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Though the use of sugar has persisted for as long as humans have been able to get their hands on sugarcane, our modern society is always looking for a way to get the benefits without the consequences. However, every time there seems to be a new miracle alternative, there's always pushback. Maybe it's justified. It's for the best that we do our due diligence on what we consume. But maybe it's because people are worried that there's no such thing as a free lunch. 
Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing for more. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next one. Thank <laughs> you.